where we come together to learn, to share, uh, to taste some interesting new goods that have come to the market um, and to help us ensure that the planet is left in a better place than we found it. This event is a cafe culture. We're bringing it into your homes, wherever you are. It's in partnership um, with Jennifer's Coffee and Godwellion Shared Horizons. Sustainable Wales is a grassroots charity with fairness at its heart and a focus on consumerism, climate and culture. Now, by the time we've had our breakfast, we've relied on half the world. Martin Luther King reminds us of how interconnected and interdependent we all are in a globalised world. Godwellion, Shared Horizons, is a real book with real stories about real life. Climate change is complicated, and by using culture, we can help to disseminate and come together to mitigate. I'm Ellen, I'm a trustee of Sustainable Wales, and I'm the director of Jennifer's Coffee, who we're working with today. Uh, this coffee uh, is from Uganda, so we're trying to bring this as global as we possibly can this morning. We've got Rob in Porthcawl, Sampurna in uh, Mumbai in India, and Chris is also in the Welsh Valleys. So if you raise your uh, cup today to celebrate the beginning of this event, um, we're all on this same planet. Climate change respects no national boundaries, and that's what we look to explore and discover today. Now, first of all, Rob, you are the editor, the writer, you're an environmentalist, you're a director of, and founder of Sustainable Wales. Tell us more about Godwellion Shared Horizons. The idea for the anthology was Margaret Minhinex, and um, I agree with it totally. And uh, she asked, is it possible to do this quickly? I said, if the writers meet their deadlines, it will be. Almost all of them did meet that deadline, which was quite severe. It was the 1st of June uh, last year that they had to get their text in to me. But uh, there are nine writers from Wales, two from Scotland, and five from India. Scotland, because um, COP26 was held in Glasgow, the big uh, climate festival, and so, so we wanted Scottish representation then. Uh, we were determined to make it as global as possible. And who better than Sam Purna Chatterjee to organize things in India for us? And Sam Purna has been marvelous, gathering five writers, including herself, together for this anthology. And um, there are nine writers from Wales, one of two of whom are here today, uh, Chris Morelis and myself. Thanks, Rob. So we're actually going to hear um, extracts um, of this anthology uh, direct from the writers and you representing some of the others that couldn't be with us today. Um, so where do I fit into all of this, Rob? Why have you asked me to be part of this? Well, you're, well you are on the board of Sustainable Wales, which is important. Uh, you're bilingual, you're a, a bilingual asset to the charity, which is really important. Our Welsh language is not as good as it might be or could be. Uh, but you're also extremely important for the fair trade movement in Wales because you, you import yourself, uh, Jennifer's Coffee, and I went with you about 10 days ago to see it being roasted in Bridget, a marvellous process, uh, all the way from Uganda, where each coffee berry is picked by hand and, and brought to our, our cups by an extraordinary, beautiful process. And I was really impressed by that. Uh, you're here because you're a real hands-on person, Ellen. You know what, Rob? I think it's quite interesting because you're telling stories and that's what I think we're trying to do through products. So when I met Jennifer in 2010 and she said to me, Ellen, the best way that you can help us in Uganda, very, very prone to climate change, um, some in extreme poverty, landslides, um, real, real challenges, deforestation and so on, 
um, and needed to tell that story, the best way we could help them is by their coffee. So I'm really delighted that this coffee is for sale in Sust and that we're able to tell the story of how hard the farmers work, how paying a fair price is actually the way through to, to climate justice, because you cannot have climate justice without trade justice. And if we're going to tackle it, we need to ensure that everybody um, is getting their fair share. And that's where COP was very, very important. We brought Jennifer over from Uganda to be able to tell her story and, and to ensure that the, the voices of the farmers, those at the front line of climate change, our canaries, uh, as it were, the, are heard and that the projects and plans um, are real and are going to have the greatest impact. So delighted to roast this um, product, um, bring it, import it into Wales. It's a bilingual brand. We've spelt it um, the Welsh way. All the packaging is bilingual. We tell a story about how this uh, responds to climate change and what the farmers are doing being do, do to support that. So by bringing a complicated issue into your day-to-day -day world. It's an absolute privilege um, to be, you know, a Welsh-based social enterprise. And so when everybody is drinking every day, thinking these are really complicated issues, how can we very quickly and simply make a contribution? Um, and that's what fair trade can do, particularly during these two weeks. You can tell one more person about it. You can sample a new product. You can talk about that and carry that story on. So delighted to be here and, and sharing this. Um, so Rob, who, your, who is your first guest this morning? Who are you going to invite to speak? Our first guest is uh, Sampira Chatterjee from India, who will tell us, I think, her coordinates in India, because her essay, I believe, in God Well on Trade Horizons, begins with her coordinate, where she's living or speaking from today. Uh, Sampurna is a practice writer, she's a poet, a fiction writer, a translator, an editor. She has 20 books, well there were 20 in her biography, there might be more than 20 now, and those books include short story collections about Mumbai, Bombay, and maybe the most recent is uh, Dirty Love from Penguin, and also novels like Rupture and Land of the Well, both from Harper Collins, and translations from other Indian writers. The latest poetry collection is Space Gulliver Chronicles of an Alien from Harper Collins 2020, and she will tell us where she's actually speaking from now. Welcome, Sampurna Chatterjee. Thanks, Robert, and thank you for asking me to be part of this event. Um, so what I thought I'll do is maybe just give you a little glimpse uh, of where I am through the piece that I contributed to Shared Horizons. And I think there's um, a little prefatory note, which is simply to do with so far my writerly obsession has been, has been with Mumbai, or Bombay, as we continue to call it. Um, and because Robert's brief was, how does one write from where we are, not in a global sense, but in a very hyper local sense, I looked out of my window, I looked outside the balcony, and I saw these very ancient hills. And the ancient hills um, prompted me to write this piece. Um, which I'll just maybe share a little extract from. Is that okay, Robert, if I do that? In That's lieu fine. of. Please. Uh, so it's called Last She Looked. When the wet came, it was feral. Thick tongued and circling, it fell upon the paving stones where the cars lay, still as bleached bone. It was the cyclone passing on from Kerala, mutating into this soup that fell out of the sky. It wasn't yet time for the wet. How did dust turn into rain, wet into sound, giant into dwarf? Wasn't this the dry time, the scandalous time when slopes caught fire without a human hand? <sighs> Those fires were once manually lit. 
biodiversity damaged by man-made forest fire, April 5, 2019. Bursts of flame that sent primordial shudders through her heart as she watched from her dark balcony, big enough for one folding chair and an entire expanse of sky. She had been sitting there for years, growing old as the hills. At first, there was nothing, nothing human, that is, just the forest. That's what it was. Not yawling with bikers, just forest, silent and unnameable as the hill that looked like a giant lying on her side. Then came the smokers, the chewers, the male urinators around the pan shop, nailed into the bowl of the rain tree. Then came the cricket pitch, concrete slab where pigeons fed on scattered seed each morning. Then came the felling of trees, the hewing of road, the sudden springing of passageway, the privilege of cars over leopards, now caught only on insomniac cameras signaled by the petrified howls of pie dogs, white spotted ghosts looking for food in their own backyard. For she lived in their backyard, didn't she? She was their tenant. And they asked no price except some privacy to hunt and feed at will. With the sinew torn out of her haunch, she flickered like haze, her crippled giant. Yevur, what did this ancient word mean? She searched and did not find. What she found was mythical, changeable lizards, Indian migrants, angles, sunbeams, granite ghosts, ditch jewels the chocolate albatross, the cloak and dagger bee, tickles, flower peckers, robber flies, lunar moths, albino crabs. Were these her neighbors all along? Why did she never see them except on screen? What was a hood with not one neighbor to be seen? She had once walked all the way up to the village on top of the hills, past the Air Force Station. She remembers the drop in temperature the instant she entered the gates. 60 square kilometers of deciduous degraded by anthropogenic activities. Buffer zone prickle of cool on skin, trees named by meticulous foresters, 50 feet trees, high undergrowth, signs that said, what the birds and the butterflies look like. Rounded Piero, Vindian Bob, absent in Thani City, common in Yevur, where the wildlife lived. Why, oh why, had she not gone there more often before? She whispered as she fingered the green bedspread that was all that remained, all that reminded of habitat. Hear the circles of harvesters. Hear the women with the sheaves. The women stirring cook pots, cradling babies. Hear the pots of water astonishingly balanced on heads. Hear finger millet, cane, barrow, crop. And here in the center, the blower of the bhopu. Cornucopia to his lips, last remainder of bounty, reminder of what once was where now nothing is but, but drought and parched lip, a blighted land, 44.4 kilometers north of the Arabian Sea, which eats away at the city once known as Bombay. She shifts her fingers to the braille of her katha top, a gift from her marshland mum, green as the cover she lies on. Someone without superstition, will wrap herself in the whirling, whirly dancers of Maharashtra, great state down on its knees, her giantess broken, beetle colony, ant pagoda, three seasons, names of human constructions built out of sand. Champion and marvelous. Thank you very much indeed. Powerful as all your writing is. Superb and beautifully read as well. Thank you. Ellen? 
I will introduce our second reader now, who will be Chris Meredith. Christopher Meredith, his most recent publications are still a volume of poetry from Seren Books and a novel, Please, both published in 2021, so they're very recent. A critical monograph about Chris's writing was published by the University of Wales Press in 2018, while his first novel, Shifts, is a Seren classic. Christopher lives in Brecon, and I think, I hope Chris will read his contribution to God Well Known, Shade Horizons, which is a poem from the, uh, the last book of poetry, Still, and the poem is called Steampunk Jungle. Thank you, Rob. Thanks very much. Um, yes, I, I will do exactly that. Try and stop me. Um, this poem uh, took me a long time to write. Uh, it's called Steampunk Jungle, as you, you say. And um, I, it, it goes back to 2017. My, my youngest son, who's in his 30s, lives in the Swansea Valley, not very far from here, about half an hour away from where I live. And uh, as you know, Rob, and as, as other people out there may know, the Swansea Valley is, uh, was very heavily industrialized. I'm from the industrial valleys myself, but not the same area. Swansea Valley is a little bit different from my home patch. Um, but I like uh, Sam Purna's phrase, you know, hyper local. Uh, and, and this poem, I think, does that as well by, you know, trying, trying to touch big things to the, to the very local. And uh, I, I, I did a walk with my son near where he lives, uh, the, the, where the old railway line used to run in the Swansea Valley, which is the, the other side of the river from where he lives. Uh, the railway line's gone, you know, as, as many people will know. As soon as the coal was gone, they ripped up the railway lines in most of the valleys. Uh, they didn't, didn't worry about what, how the people travelled anymore. You know, they got the coal. Um, uh, that's now a cycle track and a, and, a, and, a, and a footpath. And we were walking there. Now, the, the, uh, the east side of that valley is a very kind of um, looming ridge of a mountain above you, which is wooded, uh, very close, almost no houses there. And it's all in almost perpetual shade. And it's damp, uh, and uh, you know, damp as Swansea, as the saying goes. You know, and um, uh, we were there on a particular day. It was intensely hot, and the combination of the the heat, the humidity, uh, the sound of the river, the sound of traffic on the main road, the other side of the river, and this strange uh, bit of woodland, which was actually punched through with old coal mines and ironworks um, and stuff growing in this unnatural heat. Uh, it, was a, it was a very strange experience, that walk. And uh, uh, as we walked along there, and the ground there is very black as well. Um, uh, but it's, it's kind of pleasant normally, but it was, it was very strange and oppressive. And you find the industrial remnants everywhere in the woods, uh, as well as modern stuff. Uh, and uh, we came across, um, along that path, there is a, a memorial to the last four miners killed underground in Wales, which was exactly 10 years ago this year, just 10 years ago. We think of these things as Victorian or 20th century, but this was 10 years ago. And uh, there's a makeshift memorial put up by these, these four men's families with kind of photographs in plastic wallets and, and bits, of, bits of pit work stuff and toys, you know. Uh, pair of shoes uh, uh, left around there. And then we, we in, in a stream, we came across something that we thought was a broken cog from an old machine. And we thought it was, you know, maybe 150 years old, but it turned out to be about 70 million years old. And uh, so this is called Steampunk Jungle. It took me three or four years to find a way to write this poem. And I was actually in Scotland when I wrote it uh, in, in a coal mining area in Scotland, with a very similar kind of post-industrial past, and I had to be that far away to, uh, to find the line to write this poem. So Steampunk Jungle. That hot day, when the ridge in perpetual shade, even that ridge bulging above us, sweated and steamed, 
We walked you and I through the hot mash in darkness, where they ripped up the rail track and the river was sunstruck and brown through the trees. And the streams off the mountain, the paths and the ditches were black with dead waters, and huge beaches and oak dug their toes in the black scree that urged them to slide and to topple and crush us. We walked you and I in the drowning forest, in the lattice of darkness, and splashes of sunlight that lasered the canopy. And look, you said, look, the marsh orchids. And mechanical as lampposts, they lit up the walkway to that branch tangled shrine in the steampunk jungle, a gibbet with pit boots, a pit lamp and battery, a hard hat on a post like a skull in a story, dead flowers, old snapshots, and felt pen endearments, and makeshift mo this makeshift memorial to those four last miners maybe the very last to drown in these mountains in black mud and stone. And we passed fallen tunnels like broken gods gaping, smashed chapels of engines in ivy lianas, and amid the racked forest, a pylon surged upward out of the bramble that fern and the knotweed, and the mineral grew scaly and xylem and girda, and soared overhead in the paleozoic anthropocene. And look, you said, look, and there in the rust rills that ran from the mountain among roots and rail ends, look, and there was the cracked cog of some great machine, and with mud rusty fingers we hauled it from water, the massy half disc of it, hand thick and fluted, precise notches locking on sweating air, and we carried it down to the still living river and washed it where alder tongues lapped at the water. We washed it, this relic, this fragment of hubris, and didn't know then there was no hand that made it, this fiber made iron, this fern from the hot swamps, from the ages when sweet air bred marvels and giants, and all oh, my dead fathers, my burning earth's children, who forced me to witness, it never was crushed to the carbon that killed us. And we didn't know then it would wither in sunlight and crumble to nothing, this tree before time, and over the drum rush where river beat boulders, we heard the mad traffic still roaring for murder, and a terror saw heron wheeled over the river, and a dipper too beaten for flying or diving fell down to a rock in the seething brown waters, and spreading the cross of herself on the stone, she grew still. Chris Jochenbaum, thank you very much indeed. And still that last word, is also the title of your latest volume of poetry from Seren Books. Can I ask you to pronounce that very long word again, please? Go uh, on. Yeah. Uh, Go on. You, you can do it. Paleozoic Anthropocene. Yeah. Uh, my son, who's the subject of that poem, uh, was very yeah. pleased to find that that was a Google whack. Uh, well, you know, you can put it in on a search and nothing comes up. And that's because I made it up. <laughs> Paleozoic Anthropocene. Okay. Eight, eight syllables, I think. And uh, all in one line. But thank you very much indeed, Chris. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I'm going to return to Sampurna, who I believe is willing to read an extract from Nabonita's uh, contribution to Golwellun Shared Horizons. I, I, I'll just say a little, little bit about Nabonita. Nabonita Kanungo is a writer and geographer based in Shillong, India. She has written essays and articles on aspects of Indian culture, landscape, and memory, development, developmental economics and geological history. Kanungo is also the author of two collections of poetry, A Map of Ruins, 2014, and 159, published in 2018. And thank you, Sampuna, for taking this on. Yeah, so it's a pleasure for me to read a little extract from Nobonita's um, piece, which is titled, A Lost Animal Shares My History. In the 15 years of my love affair with poetry, I have perhaps not been so preoccupied with anything more than romancing dead and passing landscapes. 
The sight of a clump of green has invariably touched me, brought me closer to centeredness. In a clumsy back room of my mind, my words rehearsed their dumb performance for that one shining moment of communication, the neighborhood I was born and grew up in, a place which is also time, an answer as much as a question as to why one might turn to a tree, a river, or even the plants in one's garden with the desperation, guilt, and longing of a lover. Why one mourns and commits to an unrelenting search for a lost arboreal world of berries, hedges, and nameless flowers. Why one could be afflicted with the passing of a taste grieve the sight of a stunted peach or plum. What strips my search of its seemingly nostalgic landscape gazing is the mantle of history my neighborhood broodingly bears. A past that lurks around the corner to ambush me, one of the third generation of refugees from erstwhile East Pakistan with curt questions. The locale is the echo of a final answer. At 40, I am startled to see how this neighborhood survives its fragmentedness, how it still breathes in us, real and imagined. I turn away from my window and I write slowly in my notebook. It's that pure devastation of picking the gilded frame that defines absence speaks the name of tomorrow's Dead Sea, extinction. Warm-blooded fur turning sepia in albums and talks. On certain afternoons, watching a leaden sky hanging low against the bars of this prison, we go eye-rolling smug, complain complaining of May's rain cold. Now, we cannot even bear imagining the hill's winters. We dole out concern to the man, suggest the woman glean joy from the season's flowers until we arrive again. We perform well, for each year the sadness grows less in the act. We've almost healed from wondering why utensils look unfamiliar always, cabinets feel strange to the touch, why the wooden floor, dead ancestor, slips back into childhood, tripping us over until we've learned to walk again, out of the body, into water. We check in, annual guests, beaming stupid with vacation plans. Come evening, father's shadow will crawl to the ends of the earth for the firmest fish, the tenderest mutton, the best rice. At night, he'll be sick with so much running. At dawn, mother will emerge, drawing out old recipes from her heart. We have arrived with the world's hunger at our famished moorings. And inside the ventricle, time's frenzied hooves racing away to darkness, our eyes in our tongues, our tongues in our feet, scouring, sniffing, scavenging for a whiff of womb. But it's all right. This time, we'll place an order for pumpkin seed curry and dry fish chutney to keep ourselves buoyed. A smile suffers on the wind's pursed lips, the sky in a neighbor's greeting. The light of questions tuned to music breaking into scar. The house shines with lost savings and the roof is a hilly roof red as we'd so wanted it to be. Nothing but hilly roof red, we had told the man from thousands of years away. We, the inheritors of his reign, and please don't let out the living room and turn the house into a tunnel. We have to enter by the backyard like thieves. We've entered the garden where another April has vanished into weeds. But where is a house in a place that never was? Where a garden with bodies on the edge of dream? Thank you, Sampurna. <clears throat> Beautifully read. And Sapuna has been a very important person for the production of Gone Well on Trade Horizons. Uh, she's frankly the Indian editor. I, I went to Sapuna as the first choice of Indian writers 
and I knew that she was knowledgeable of the the myriad cultures of India, so many, and who better than Sampurna to choose for other writers to represent marvelous Indian literary production. And could you tell us briefly, Sampurna, why you chose the other four writers that mm -hmm. you uh, selected, please? Yeah, I think, you know, it was, um, I've been trying to think what is it that made me gravitate to the four. That's Tishani Doshi, Aditi Angiras, Nabanita Kanungo, whose piece I read, and Priya Sarukai Chabria. And I think uh, I had a much longer list when I began. But I had, I realized, uh, Robert, there were a few things that I wanted the selection to do. And uh, one was, um, it was, one was geographical, frankly, if I'm looking at it, how do I get a sense of India across in a, in such a, um, such a very, in a sort of concise, condensed way, uh, which would reflect the enormity of our geographical spread without trying to do that impossible thing, which is to be representational. So I think what I did is I went with my instinct uh, towards writers whose writing I've been familiar with, whose writing I admire. And also because I felt these were women and eventually I settled, it was an all women cast as I realized. Uh, I went for women who had been living in their specific locations for a, for a considerable amount of time, Robert, I think this had to do with your brief to me that how can we look at, let's not talk again in global terms, let's talk, let's look at the square mile. And I realized that without acknowledging the passage of time vis-a-vis -vis one's location, um, climate change remains a bit abstract. It, it doesn't come through as a lived reality. So I yeah. went for people whose locations, whether it's uh, Aditi lives in Delhi. So I did want a landlocked place and that was Delhi. And uh, I avoided Bombay. I myself didn't write about Bombay, though the urge to write about the coastal, the inundations, all of that was very, very uh, tempting. But I avoided that temptation. I preferred to go a little inland to lesser known neighborhoods, one being my own. Lesser known, let's say, to the outside world was Thane and also Pune, which is also in Maharashtra, but it's inland. And uh, Tishani I chose for the coastal, but it was Tamil Nadu. So, and I know that she also lives between India and Wales. So that was my, she, she's... Um, that was my way of acknowledging the long connection, Robert, that we've had through our many interactions. And I chose Nabanita because the northeast of India often gets overlooked in mainstream discourse. And I was really very, very keen on having voices that wouldn't be the first names you would immediately think of, either in terms of location, language or preoccupations. So I think those were some of the reasons why I finally arrived at this bunch of four. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for that um, explanation. Uh, and it goes some way to explaining why all your choice is on women. That, that's great. Uh, um, yes, it makes the book better, I think. And uh, uh, that geographical spread across India is uh, necessary, I think. Um, what I, I did say to uh, Sampurna was that um, surrealism and science fiction, I think, are approaches, are literary approaches to explaining, if you can explain, climate change. Uh, they're as good as other methods of doing that. Um, I mean, in a way, they have to uh, 
fit in almost with a, a dystopian way of um, describing the, the new situation we find ourselves in and that they've got to engender disturbing, terrifying, uh, peculiar futures. And um, in that way, forms of that writing are well established. Like there are famous examples, uh, such as George Orwell's 1984 and more recent The Roads by Cormac McCarthy. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, this dystopian form of writing can exist within poetry and has done for, well, several hundreds of years, in fact. Um, there are ways of projecting into the future, projecting us into our future, and noting similarities with our own situation today. I, I have to bring in here the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which contains extraordinary similarities to George Orwell's 1984. And 1984 is a novel which I tend to read every year and nod my head as it gets more and more up to date and plausible and possible, mm -hmm. not impossible, totally possible. Mm. Does anyone want to say anything about that? I, I, something occurred to me, uh, Rob, as you were speaking then, that uh, I, I didn't expect the conversation to go this way, but uh, in science fiction, it's very, very interesting to look at Richard Jeffries. Um, you know, in the, in the 19th century, he was a great kind of ruralist and who kind of could see countryside vanishing as, 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 in, as industrialization developed in England. And, for many years, he was kind of appropriated by uh, a, a kind of a nostalgia uh, uh, following, if you like, it's kind of hankering after a, a lost rural past and all of that. But actually, I mean, uh, his novel After London uh, is, uh, I mean, it's not a good novel, to be honest with you, but it's an extraordinary one. And that's very interesting to look at, where he, he imagines a future where there's been some catastrophe and uh, England, I mean, he's a very English writer, uh, uh, the centre of England has become a great lake. Uh, there's a kind of an inland sea occupying the entire centre of England. And the, the, the plot of the novel, such as it is, is that everything's re reverted to a kind of feudalism and a sort of a, a feudal, a young, high up feudal lord type person with, a, with the extraordinary name of, you know, his name is, I think it's, uh, I, I may get this wrong, so somebody will correct me perhaps. It's something like uh, Felix Aquila, I think. But he sets off on a journey and he sails across this lake and he gets to London. And he just, and there's, a, there's a, an extraordinary description of burned wasteland, uh, like a premonition of, of uh, you know, the kinds of apocalyptic things that we, we, we are, we are trying hard to avoid talking about when we talk about mm -hmm. the war in the Ukraine. You know? So, I mean, mm -hmm. the science fiction thing, I, I think Jeffries is an interesting figure to look at in that way. He's got another extraordinary short story uh, called Snowed Up, where he just imagines it starts snowing and never stops. Mm -hmm. And he just describes it from the point of view of a young woman at home watching it snow. And then nothing happens, it just keeps on coming. and <laughs> Nobody can do anything, you know. And that, that sense of help, helplessness in the, in the face of change is, you know, is, it's a kind of a metaphor for that. So I, I think there are all kinds of uh, fictions yeah. out there that you look at, because they, they scatter, they, they, they're saying all kinds of different things, and, and there's, there's a lot of hit and miss, you know. I mean, um, I, I, I frequently miss, to be honest with you. Uh, Indeed. Indeed. But at the other end of the scale, you, you get a writer like Philip K. Dick, uh, who I've read a little bit. Uh, um, to me, his, his fiction is all about paranoia. Uh, uh, American paranoia in particular, um, and uh, of course, Dick actually lived this out in his own life when he was offered a, uh, a literary award. Um, Stanislav Lem, the, uh, the, the Russian scientist, the Polish actually science fiction writer, uh, wanted to give him an award for his achievements in science fiction, and, and um, uh, 
Dick became convinced that this was a this was a Soviet conspiracy against him. Right. <laughs> he was as mad as cheese, and he, yes. he wrote to the FBI and told them, you know, they're after me. Because we're an American. But, uh, um, speaking about dystopian forms of writing, uh, the Sustainable Wales project, Letters from the Future, has been going on for yeah. 15 yeah. years. It, it's our own modest attempt yeah. to uh, um, create a global issue uh, or a, 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 a a, glo a global project that looks at what's going on locally and mm. internationally. And thus, Gorello and Shared Horizons is ambitious and also global. And if we sell enough copies, I keep having to tell people that if people actually buy it, it costs nine pounds, it's on a special issue of a special price today. Um, there will be a second volume, and we've already discussed what the cover should look like and what color the cover will be. But we need to sell some copy. The, the, the complaint of bookshops worldwide, we need to sell some books and we have to sell more Gorel on Shared Horizons. As to one of my contributions to Gorel, uh, it's called Fun and When. Funnel is a spring or a, a well, I mean, in this case, a spring, and it means white, when can mean white, white spring. And it was the first contribution to this anthology. And I, I wrote it while sitting on the shore in Porto, about a mile from here, uh, west of us here, looking towards the Gower Peninsula, a, a beautiful uh, peninsula that juts out into the Bristol Channel. On Gower is a small mountain called Kevin Bryn. And I, I've always thought when I look at uh, the Gower, that Kevin Bryn resembles a volcano. Indeed, it might be a volcano in its own right, in its um, historical right. And that's the Italian volcano Vesuvius came to mind with its famous eruption that buried the city of Pompeii. And because this was right at the beginning of the COVID-19 emergency, I imagine the airborne ash of Vesuvius as COVID-19 viruses falling upon everyone. And you could not expect escape uh, that volcanic ash or the COVID viruses. And my wife and I, uh, Margaret Mintig, know very well because we haven't escaped the viruses. We've actually caught COVID and survived it. So it can be bad, but you, it doesn't have to be the end of the world. And I'm going to read a part of that poem, and I'll explain here that uh, whippets is an English slang word for small nitrous oxide canisters found as litter. They're now ubiquitous wherever you look. They're just a form of litter. And like Sam Pirna's, uh contribution to Gorellan, uh, my uh, text begins with uh, a, a very detailed uh, description of the Ordnance Survey map of where Fanon Wen is, and I'm going to dispense with that. Fanon Wen, a life of sorts, undoubtedly a life. I live it at the wave's edge in the white quartz. That life spent listening to shells. But how else shall I spend my time? Salt around the pools today, like chalk where the dead bodies lay. Yet somehow a promise will be kept. 
Towers of smoke above this beach, it clints and breaks all rains might reach. But wait, were there volcanoes on the Gower? I've been to Pompeii and seen the last bus arrive, its timetable under an inch of ash. The slaves buried alive, the prostitutes buried alive, the gladiators buried alive, the dog walkers carrying plastic bags buried alive, the sunbathers smeared in factor 40 buried alive, the lifeguards with their highlights and Samoan tattoos buried alive, the brawling boys and their silver whippets buried alive, the philosophers in their caves buried alive, and the girl who sells mivies and the magnums and soleros buried alive, and not all of them two meters apart, thank the gods I always wear a mask. But who are the people who build these driftwood shacks and lie with the bone white dead we all must become? Are our children the fossils of the future? Might be millennia ago, or a part of next year's fairground pixels. Yet a life of sorts, undoubtedly a life lived at the wave's edge in the white quartz. A hut for one night, built from driftwood and the sea's plastic. Yet something once flourished here, and might so again. The cults will rise and rule and fall away. Aeons it might take, but eventually each tribe returns to its territory. Sandstone like blood under the stone, under the sea, and veins of quartz that led me here. But who are these people building with sticks white as ivory? A life of sorts, undoubtedly a life lived at the wave's edge in the white quartz. Now and then and now and then, golf balls and jellyfish at fun on when, towers of smoke and above the steelworks beach, or the scalding rain and burning light of the Vesuvian night. Salt around the pools today, like chalk where once the bodies lay, and no way back until this driftwood reassembles itself. It sticks white as ivory, and we can all lay ourselves down amongst its terrible bones. Good. That is a very, very local to Port Call, to Port Cowell, area it's half a mile up the road and that's why we i think that was margaret's idea that we would base our writings on a very very pronounced local area the world we knew like some pino looked through her window and decided i've got to write about what what i see in front of me and i think just about everybody's done in Gorellion. um what I'm going to do now is toast again with Jennifer's coffee, which is still on offer here in our shop. And online. And online. Uh, as a book is available online, as is Jennifer's coffee available online. Uh, does anybody want to say anything from India or from Brecon or from London to the rest of us? You know, I have one question, which is, uh, is the fee and the book available for readers and coffee lovers in Bombay, for example? Oh, uh, could you repeat that? 
uh, for me, please, Sampurna. Ah, just a question about whether the book that is Gorwellian, which I, of course, have my copy of, is it available yeah. uh, for readers in India? It is certainly available for reading or for sale in India. Well, it will be. Um, uh, it will be just in, in, in parts in books, distribute their books or their lists in India. It will be available. It can be purchased online from part of, or from Sustainable Wales in Wales. And I personally will post them away to to anywhere, um, I, I know that two of the contributors that didn't receive the copies, and I re reposted the, them mm -hmm. to them. Um, who knows? Because the British Postal Service isn't great. I'm not sure how good the Indian Postal Service is either. But I actually did it myself, honestly. And who can say what happens? Now? Yeah, I'll let you know. Okay, thanks for that, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. I think it's Ellen. a question, Sampurna. Um, I think if if you were to coordinate one package and could disseminate locally, I think we could maybe work yeah. something out. I'll, I'll figure this out because, you know, I think it's important to uh, get it from the source. I think that's one thing that all of us are trying for. And uh, let me speak to a friend of mine. Maybe there's a way in which a publisher friend of mine can host it on his website so the purchasing can happen through that portal. So I'll think about some uh, maybe creative solutions to making this book because, you know, I also noticed how, um, I, w I mean, you know, it's how much you don't know about your own mm. uh, places. Because when I was reading Tishani's uh, um, piece earlier this morning, and I read it, of course, when I was sending it across to Robert, I realized that that expansiveness of history that can be compressed into a prose piece with a given um, word limit is perhaps something that only the very best of poets can do, poets who write prose. And Robert, when you were asking me, I later realized I'd chosen all the people I'd chosen were poets who also wrote, wrote prose. Excellent. And yeah, it was like, what, what is it? What does that tell us about the way in which uh, the attentiveness with which we regard our worlds? And I think that came through so beautifully from both your pieces, Robert and Chris, that it's the felt knowledge that gets translated into something that is. Um, that is genuinely going to say something about what we notice. It's no longer than, because I feel the greatest problem right now is how do we, how do we transform this senselessness into some kind of coherence, which we then begin navigating with action. And I think this sense to senselessness is perhaps where surrealistic or um, or you know, sci-fi narratives help us do that because we have no way of transforming this present or investigating this reality other than you know jumping off into some other reality. But huh. uh, unfortunately, we are here. We are stuck right here, and the future is here. It's no longer we can't project it any further. We are sitting in the middle of it, and I think that's what's so scary, and that comes home very clearly too what I just heard this afternoon. So I wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you, Sampuna. <clears throat> uh, Ellen, please. Uh, well, in light of the fact that you um, asked for some Welsh language, I'm going to read a poem by Kasia William when she was Bardd Plant Cymru, uh, the youth um, poet for Wales. It's a call for action and it's aimed at young people. And I think that they are obviously at the heart of any solution that Sam Perna is calling for. It's called help. Lantus Cymru a welwch i'r glaw, bynagrau i'r rhain, yn dysgyn mewn braw. Lantus Cymru a glwch i chymru yng rech, mae'r salwch yn teini i bob man fel brech. Lantus Cymru rhwng peswch yn tagu i'r holl, Vugar plastic, my nanoth anadli. 
Lantus Cymru rwy'n sgrychian mewn pa, panig. Rwy'n hiraethu am yr ia a o'r chyddiau'r ar Arctig. Lantos Cymru a deimlwch i'r gres, mae'n llosgi fy nghroen dod y nes ac yn hes. Lantos Cymru a fedrwch i addo bod yn wahanol i'ch bod chi am drio. Lantos Cymru a newch i fy nghwarchod, mae amser o hyd i ddad wneud y difrod. Lantos Cymru os y gweithiwch yng nghyd, fy rof i chi'r cwbl, fy rof i chi'r byd. And briefly, children, children, can you hear me cry? These are my tears streaking the sky. Children, children, can you hear me roar? The pain is searing, the pain is raw. Children, children, can you hear me choke? And all this plastic, all this smoke. Children, children, can you feel me scream? I miss icy oceans and grass so green. Children, children, can you feel the heat? It's burning all over my face, my heat. Children, children, can you promise me that you will be different? Will set me free? Children, children, I'll be here forever if you make me a promise to make me feel better. Children, children, if you give me your word, I will give you my all. I will give you the world. So to end on a, a moment of hope, because this is a significant issue that we are trying to tackle, to bring alive real stories. Um, you know, Jennifer herself would say that it's not, as Darwin would say, it's not the strongest of species that survive, it's those that are most adaptable to change. And she is having to adapt. The, the weather patterns that we're seeing here in the UK are very similar to that on the equator where January is a, a, a period of, of sowing and it's rained continuously. So there's a shift going on and it's real and it's happening. Um, so to give us a, an essence of hope, um, God by Cariad, faith, hope and love that we share, we come together, we raise our cuppa. Um, please go to the link below uh, at Sussed Wales' website uh, to purchase Godwellion on special offer and you will get um, a packet of um, 100 grams of either beans or grounds of Jennifer's coffee to sample and share your story. Um, thank you all. Uh, see you again soon. Let's do this again. <laughs>